Awesome. So uh, next presenter, um, <laughs> Mariah Bryans. Uh, she is an alum of this program um, and uh, for, uh, Clay Center, Kansas originally. Um, she, uh, was, it doesn't matter. Um, she, she is here to talk about paint and preservation and um, so uh, she has worked in several uh, various restoration shops since graduating. Um, she had some great internship opportunities also. Um, she and her husband Maxwell uh, worked at a private collection in St. Louis uh, taking care of that. Um, she started her own business, uh, primarily doing uh, paint re repair, conservation, preservation. Um, pretty interesting. And like for me, having been here, it's kind of an, a part of the industry and hobby that's grown a lot. So she's going to kind of talk about that and show uh, what they do. Now she and her husband have moved back to Lindsborg, about 12 miles up the road. They have a, a restoration shop there now doing primarily paint preservation paintwork, uh, trim and upholstery. Uh, so Mariah, here you go, it's all yours. Um, and we'll do the same thing as before, just if you've got a question, get your hand up and, and we'll try and get your attention. <laughs> it's good to see such a great turnout. I'm glad that you guys in all these crazy times have been able to make it um, and are upright and healthy. That's always good to see. Um, like Chris said, and a big thanks to him for um, letting me kind of teach what I do. Um, I started out in full frame off restoration about 10 to 15 years ago, um, doing mostly Mopar, DeSoto, um, Dodge Royal Lancer. Um, I've done several 57 Thunderbirds and Baby Birds and um, things of that nature straight out of school. Um, I did that for about five years um, here in Kansas, and then I moved on to St. Louis when I met my husband, Maxwell, and we got married. And um, he signed on to a private collection there in St. Louis, uh, who um, was basically the CEO of Hunter Engineering Corporation. Uh, so all your tire balancing equipment, your lifts, um, things of that nature. Uh, he was in charge of that company until about uh, 2016, I'd say. Um, and then his sons took over. Um, he had a private collection of about 200 plus cars of all makes and models from 70s restorations to one off. And if it was in black, he owned it. Um, if it wasn't in black, sometimes he put it in black. Um, he, uh, when I moved to St. Louis, um, the job I took on was high-end Concord paint um, because I had a pretty big paint knowledge. Um, I have a full art degree out of uh, McPherson College as well, and I have a master's. Um, well, pretty much through here, but also through the state of California. Um, so I have a big art background, and um, so I got out of the full frame off restoration and got into figuring out how to do the high end Concour paint, but on a, I would say, collision speed. So you're putting out quality paint at an auto body shop speed, and it was boot camp, and I about failed. And about three days in, I was pretty sure I wasn't going to survive in the city. Um, needless to say, they had a single stage um, paint job that was a 30s Lincoln. It has since once uh, won awards at Pebble Beach. Um, and they didn't, they basically sanded open the fresh paint but they let it sit too long, and then they couldn't get it buffed and polished. And I learned enough organic chemistry here and paint technologies and other substrates here that I took all that knowledge, and I kind of saved their butt at Pebble Beach more than once. And so I had the job. <laughs> the speed came natural after that, and um, I ended up being head painter with that company before they closed down and I moved on to my own business. Um, so I've been in business for myself for about seven years, um, part of it in St. Louis um, since 2020, um, right when the country shut down, we were here moving back to Kansas. Um, 
From that high-end Concord paint, we learned that there was a big preservation need. And, and more than just preservation or keeping something in a humidity-controlled building in a museum, we learned there was a need for, let's just take care of what we have. And so from there, I helped um, and am continuing to help uh, the community on a conservation and preservation level um, to basically develop preservation guidelines for judging, including Pebble Beach. I've been Pebble Beach judge for two years in that um, category now. And um, in all of this, I've had a whole lot of chemistry, which I won't bore you with because it's one o'clock in the afternoon. And <laughs> But if you have questions, let me know. Um, I'll kind of give a, a quick synopsis, but um, I'm mainly here today to try to help you guys not be afraid to A, pick up a buffer and touch your 100-year-old paint. And Luke can attest to this back here because he let me loose on his Buick and we did all right. And, <laughs> um, and to just help maintain all of your cars that are daily drivers, whether they're Pebble Beach quality or they're straight out of the barn, you just found them trying to get them going, um, because that is what this industry is needing, and it's a big gap, and um, it's the gap that everyone's looking to kind of fill. So I, I joke that I used to talk people into paint jobs, now I talk them out of it, not because I can't do it, but because there is a bigger historical um, process that probably should happen before things like that happen. And I'll watch that from a big collector that had the money to do whatever he wanted, uh, amongst others. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've done since I've been out of school. I've been helping with the 300 Mercedes project here um, on paint consultation with the, with the students. Um, I put them to work a little more than they probably would have liked because they probably wanted me to come in and just sand it for them and make it perfect, but uh, I made them work this summer. Um, like I said, I've, I've helped with Luke's Buick. Um, I'm tied into Salina's uh, new car museum going in, amongst many other things I could brag about, but I'm kind of too modest. So you can ask about it and I'll just, you know, talk your ear off if you choose, but I won't bore you with it now. Um, so anyway, I want to kind of touch, touch on um, old paint versus the new systems and how it kind of works in a layman's terms. And then I'm hoping to kind of demonstrate on Chris's car here. Um, um, anyway, I'm going to give you kind of a rundown, um, kind of give you a demonstration. If you've got a car that you've got specific questions on that you want to tackle yourself or you want to put the buffer in your hands and, you know, aren't, aren't too scared to mess up somebody else's car that I'll fix later for Paulson should it need to happen, <laughs> um, you know, feel free. It's not as scary as a lot of people make it out to be. So um, this, my main focus to this seminar is to help you feel comfortable and just maintaining and preserving what you have, what you found, what you might be after um, in your automotive needs. So first off, since we're all Model T carriage era people, the groups I like. <laughs> so I'm gonna kind of teach the difference between lacquer, enamel, and base clear. We can get in a lot of um, and discuss on all the intricacies of that. But to keep it simple, so on layman's terms, lacquer paint always breathes. It has no shell on it unless you put some wax on it. But once the wax breaks down, even in the UV, the weather, all of that, that paint is still chemically breathing to the day it falls off of your car, plain and simple. It's the way it is. So you always have to kind of keep it sealed off to A, prevent that delamination, and B, just keep those chemicals alive. Now, I've seen plenty of lacquer paint jobs 
that are dead, that are a step away from falling off, and you're not going to really do much with them. You can maintain them without making them shiny, but you know that's kind of um, it's kind of how lacquer works. Now enamels, when they came along with enamels, they figured out how to make an enamel really hard. So lacquer is softer than an enamel because it's always chemically breathing. An enamel will chemically breathe for a certain amount of time, but it breathes so fast it gets super hard. So like I was talking about with that single stage paint on that Lincoln that they didn't polish up soon enough, well, it got so hard, it was sealed off for life. So think M&M candy. You got that hard shell that has completely, you know, crystallized, so to speak, on top of that, that soft center. Now, if that top shell gets too dry, brittle, tries to delaminate, you might be able, on a chemical level, to bring that soft underneath, if it still exists, back. But polishing any enamel, new or old, good or bad, you're going to get your work out in <laughs> because it's just hard. It's very hard. But on the flip side of that, it's also been one of the most durable paints through like the 1950s and um, some of that era. So then we get into base clear. So base clear come about in the 80s, wasn't that great in the 80s, early 90s, got way, way better after that. Um, very good UV protection, very good paint, very flexible, easy to work with, easy to spray once you get into it, okay? Um, the EPA likes it and many other people um, of that um, thinking for our environment. However, it has some plasticizers in it and those plasticizers are cured off basically in 6 to 12 months. So after that time, you can throw wax on your new base clear paint job. No big deal, no big reactions, all that. The difference with base clear and enamel is once that happens, this is a layer on top of a layer. Whereas enamel is like base clear, but these two are mixed together. This is super layman's terms because I don't have time for the chemistry. So this has the protection of a base clear to a point. This is super hard. This has more flexibility when it's cured. So when you're polishing all three of these or taking a buffer to one of these, you're going to burn through this one in a hurry. You're going to wish you never picked up a buffer with this one because your arms are going to hurt before you even shine it up. And this one's going to be somewhere in between because the technology caught up and put these two together. So, um, so keep in mind, even if you repaint, you can do some of these older substrates, should you choose, make sure you put them over their equivalent primers and know what you're getting into if you're doing this yourself because you might take it back to the painter going, I messed up. <laughs> now, if you have a car just out of your barn or you're just trying to keep it clean, maintained, none of this is a big deal. Um, but this is for those who are do I repaint? Do I not repaint? You know, because those are usually the big questions I get. So as long as you kind of understand some of the basics of this going in before you pick up a buffer, you'll have a better time of knowing how to make those decisions. So with that said, all right. So this is just regular old rotary buffer. The Walt makes a beautiful one. Um, this one's from about 2016, but it's 
held up through about 300 cars, um, all the size of KB Lincolns and Cadillacs and Rolls Royce. But um, so I'm still kind of old school, but with a s new school technology. So when it comes to an old paint, I go at it first with wool. Doesn't matter if it's on polisher, doesn't matter if it's on rotary, and the reason is cotton and wool breathe. They run cooler, they breathe. These paints, the way they're set up, they like that. You take foam to it at the same speed, you're gonna, you're gonna make that paint melt because it runs hotter, it doesn't breathe, it gums up. It doesn't react with the polish the same way. It doesn't matter what polish, doesn't matter what speed, etc. So, when you're attacking a lacquer or enamel paint, it is best to go with a wool pad, whether it's on polisher or rotary, and there are different levels. So this is a super fine wool pad versus the other one I have here, which is coarse for like cutting a new paint job. And it's been at a black car, imagine that. But um, anyway, so that's a little information there as far as what to use. Brands, I've tried every brand on the market of polish, waxes, pads, equipment. You're paying for the name in a lot of respects. And I had somebody that I worked for that paid for all of that experimentation. So I'm happy to tell you, sometimes less is more. Um, so don't feel like you've got to buy that, the, the fanciest product or the, you know, all of that. Um, for example, waxes, find a good quality Carnuba wax. Meguiar's is still on top with some of that. Griot's is on top with some of that. If you really want to get silly, you can start stepping it up and, and buying the stupid expensive stuff, which the only difference I would say is it's a little lighter weight and it's got maybe a little bit of a cleaner wax in it. So a little bit of an abrasive to kind of shine things up. Um, I didn't bring it today, but the only other difference, the only other wax I would say is worth the money is super expensive. It's called black wax or Montan wax. And it's basically mined from brown coal out of Austria. And they um, break that brown coal down into brown and black pigments. And they put it in a very, very fine carnauba wax. It's about 80 to $100, I think, for about this size these days. But if you have a high-end Mercedes going on the Pebble Beach lawn, um, the can will do you more than 400 cars, and um, you'll probably surprise people with how shiny it is, even if you scratched it up on the transport. So that wax is worth buying. You guys don't care about that, um, <laughs> but for what it's worth. Um, so anyway, I usually start with a rotary buffer. When I'm cleaning a paint, so I usually start with a medium to a heavy compound if you're very, very dull. Um, I usually always wash everything first, non-detergent soaps. Um, if you have things like oil and some of that on there, you could throw a little Dawn detergent in your bucket. Um, but stay away from the laundry soaps, all the high efficiency stuff these days. All it's going to do is suck the moisture out of the paint and make you work harder to put the moisture back in the paint. Um, so outside a little Dawn detergent, I wouldn't go much farther than that with regular household soap. Um, however, once again, you don't have to buy a fancy car wash soap to wash your car before doing all this. Um, the next thing I usually do is I use a clay bar to get any sand, grit, driving dirt, you know, that kind of thing out of there. Um, I use it on glass, I use it on paint, I've used it on brass. Um, it, as long as you start with a mild enough clay, which I really like Griots. It's very price 
advantageous, and my clay is dirty, but, um, but just a standard yellow clay. They make a really good quality one. Like I said, the price point's very reasonable. Um, if you need to go a little more aggressive, you can buy Clay Magic's red clay. Um, I've really only used this a couple times on some Rolls Royces that um, really came out of a barn, were beat up, and we had to be super gentle. But um, most of the time, this will do for what you guys are doing. Take care. So, so you take your clay. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I jumped ahead. I jumped ahead. I jumped ahead. <laughs> so the biggest thing is warm up your clay, which it's cold in here and it's cold because it's been in my car. So we'll see how this goes. But um, and then I use a clay lubricant. Um, once again, if you got a really dirty car or you're just in a, in a money pinch, you could use a little Dawn detergent and some warm water. Um, I say warm water because cold water, the molecules don't spread out as much. And so you'll feel like you're sanding rather than clay boring. You'll just make yourself tired. So I usually spray down the car, but you want to get, get a bit of it in your hand. Work it into your clay. Kind of get a little bit of a, oh, it's, uh, it's really hard to. Anyway, kind of get a little bit like that. And then you're just going to kind of, you know, treat it like your dog. Like, hey, how are you doing today? <laughs> and you're going to keep turning that clay over. And the more you turn that clay over, the more it'll pull out of there. And see how it kind of catches and drags with what I'm doing? That means you're kind of running out of your, your spray lubricant there. And or it means you've picked up enough dirt, just knead it like some bread, turn it over, kind of work it out, rinse it off in a bucket if you need to, if it's really, really gritty in your hands, and go back to what you're doing. Now I do that till you kind of just glide over the surface. Um, I don't necessarily look for anything in particular on how it looks after you do it. You're really just kind of pulling the road grid out. If it feels, you know, if it's feeling pretty smooth like this is in your hand, then you're probably pretty good to move on to the, to the next step, which is where I got ahead of all of you. So, since this paint's pretty good, which I know it's hard to see, and you guys can come up and ask me questions, and we can do more one-on-one -on -one if, if you want. I'll wipe it off. And usually I start with about a medium grit um, polish. So all my polishes are silicone-free. They're water-based, um, 3M's polishes, and their line of products um, are not completely silicone free because they do have some petroleum distillates in them. There's nothing wrong with their products. They're perfectly good. So whatever you want, whatever you can afford. Um, Griots makes a great line as well for the, for the hobbyist or just cleaning up your car. Um, once again, unless you're like me, who worked in a paint booth and you had to figure out what you could sling in a paint booth, um, most of the stuff on the market is really good. So whatever your price point is and comfortability, then you know, you're, you're good to go. Um, but like I said, mine are, most of what I have is German made right now. Like I said, I was in the big city slinging stuff in a paint booth. You had to have no chemical reactions with it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, however, so with cars like this, I usually start with a medium grit, which this one's a 2500, and it's probably not mixed up, so it won't be true, but. <clears throat> and I'll do just a little on the wool pad here, if it comes out of the bottle, because it's been sitting in the cold. There we go.
I'm going to look like a novice because I'm going to trip over six chords because I'm not used to a microphone. So the rotary is always going to turn one direction. So you're always going to want to move kind of in that direction. So you're going to move in that direction and come back. Move and come back. A lot of these have a handle on them so you can hold up here. I've caught too many antennas and fingers so I don't have one. Um, I take them all off. Um, but that's just practice. So um, I set mine, since the wool stays cooler, I set mine at about this 22, between this 1800 and 22 RPM because it'll stay cool enough, it'll be gentle enough. Um, depending on your level of expertise, comfort, that's, you know, you'll know when this is too fast and, and it's trying to run out of your hand um, because this machine's a lot heavier than the polisher, I'll show you. So what I do is I come along, I kind of spread the polish out because these heavier compounds like to sling. However, the water-based ones don't sling quite as bad, which is nice. So I'll probably owe a tire cleanup to Paulson here. But. So I'll just kind of show you, you can watch how I go about it. I'm going to make it look stupid easy probably. Um, but like I said, if after all this you want to come try it out, more than welcome to um, if you don't have your own. So here we go. For, for guys like you who are maybe starting out with it, I was always taught by Chip Foose's guys, you want to lift towards the edge. Now, that doesn't mean you have to lift this whole thing up off the edge. Because you do that, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to catch all kinds of stuff in your way. Um, but what, he, what they meant by lifting towards the edge is when you hit the panel, then as you come towards this edge, you kind of lift off on when you come off the panel. I'm experienced enough going over the rivets, going over the edges. It's it's no big deal. Um, however, for you guys, that may be something you want to kind of avoid. Um, as you get more practice, you can come around them on the edge of this buffer a little bit. But that takes a decent amount of practice, so you also don't go, you know, jumping off the edge. Um, so that's kind of everything I do. It's always very light. It's just you want to let the machine do the work. You don't want to bear down on it because it's going to make the motor work harder, your arms work harder, and you're going to ruin everything on here. So. Just let the machine do its work, which is why I say the speed is just a number because it's to your comfort. So that's kind of what I do there. I get it to where it's kind of just an initial shined up, looks clean, um, and then, especially if it's really dull paint, and then from there, I put that machine away altogether. And I grab my polish. And I use um, a dual action polisher, basically. So this one is going to move in more directions than just one. It's going to move in one direction for a while, and then it's going to swap, and it's going to go backwards. And it's, it's going to come this way. It's going to go this way. It's going to go this way. Um, this one is, once again, German-made. Um, this was before all the Bigfoots were being made, so this thing's actually kind of an antique now compared to what's on the market. But um, the beauty of this and the Bigfoot polishers and some of the others on the market is they've now gotten smart and they've made them gear-driven rather than just motor and brush. 
So when you take this off of here, there's actual gears in here you can replace. And I haven't seen that in a really long time, even with some of the Makitas and the old school ones that have been around. Um, so I can tell you that a Griot's version of this, or similar on the market now, that ranges about 100 bucks, you will get through about 150 cars on a daily basis with a general old extension cord, eight hours a day, before the brushes die or the cord wears out and you can't replace anything. So, for you guys, perfect machine. For me, I had to step up. Um, this thing's lasted me through, once again, about 300 cars and is still going because the extra set of gears, I haven't even replaced them yet. Um, of course, I say that and I'll probably go use it next and it'll die. Um, but anyway, this is a flex. Like I said, there's Bigfoot on the market. There's Griots. Um, Griots is making one the style, just like Bigfoot. Um, it's, there are, you know, once again, it's what do you want to pay for? What's your comf comfortability? Are you just cleaning things up every year? Are you doing this for a living? Which, you know, obviously I have been, so, you know, I'm not going to say go buy one of these. Um, anyway, the main idea here is this polisher moves in several different directions. So, okay, so, so I was given a lecture about wool. This one's a foam pad. It's just, uh, I think the brand, brand's Lake County. I bought it on AutoGeek or Amazon. Um, they held up really well in the wash. Um, you rinse them out, wash them. Um, now, when you get to the polishing, polishing stage, I know I gave the lecture on wool, but you're not being as aggressive with the polishing stage. So this is still going to run cooler um, in the polishing because the polish is finer. This is a finer pad. You've already done the hard work. So this is really just to kind of finish, bringing up the shine to get you ready for some wax. If you even choose to do this stage, this is you know probably even overkill. Or maybe this is more comfortable and the rotary is overkill for you. It depends on your needs. Depends on if you're driving it all the time or you want a show car, et cetera. Um, but anyway, I do want to show you how this works because even with the foam, now that we've done the hard work, it will be the gentler version. So everybody that's like, oh, I'm going to wet sand this and wet sand that, this, is, this could be your substitute. With that said, this is, it's also louder. It likes to run away from you in your hands because it's going about six different directions. So it takes a little getting used to, but um, it'll help you kind of achieve that, that candy coat shell to your paint before you wax so that when you do wax, you've got a little bit of a substrate for that wax to, to be where it needs to. And I wish my photos would have been a little better because we could show you the before and after of Luke's so you could get a little better idea of how all that process worked. But, but your paint's still good, Paulson, so they'll probably go, ooh. <laughs> I know, because you're going to be like, hey, when are you going to come over for dinner and finish this? <laughs> anyway. So since we're getting probably short on time, I just want to touch on a few other things. I had one guy ask me about um, maintaining your wood. Um, so wood gets dry, clearly, um, and you need to put the oil back in the wood. Now, there's wood conditioners on the market. 
um, that you can use before you even reurethane. Um, the one I like the best for the automotive world because it puts the oil back in and it waxes it so you have the UV protection and you can just keep layering it on and buffing it out, layering it on, is Howard's Feed and Wax with some orange oil. It's got beeswax, it's got lanolin based, and, and we're going to chase the camera. Anyway, you're free to come up here and look at all this when we're done. Um, but uh, anything with that orange oil, that beeswax, that lanolin based um, for your woods, your leathers, um, you're good to go. I, in fact, in the realm of leather, if it's got a little lanolin in it, and even if it's good for just saddle and your tack on the farm, you're good. I've, I've used, once again, about every brand on the market. I have my favorites, but the only difference is uh, maybe they got more lanolin, maybe they got more mineral spirit, maybe they, you know, Maybe I paid a little more money to do that because somebody shipped me Rolls Royce leather. You know, sometimes it depends on the customer too. So, um, but anyway, that's something to think about as far as wood and um, wood and leathers. Um, vinyls don't act quite the same way. They require a little different composition. Um, I didn't bring any of that today necessarily. Um, I like the Simichrome polish. Um, once again, lots of good polishes on the market. This one's really good for um, brass nickel chrome, especially this era. Um, it's gentle. It doesn't kill your hands, um, things like that. I'm pretty unbiased on glass cleaner, as long as it's not Windex. Windex is great not great for paint if you drip it on the paint. So the rain -X on the market, go buy it at Walmart. This spray away, you can know, use it on plastic and uh, vinyl pieces in modern cars and it will not only clean but disinfect. So in our COVID world, if you don't have Lysol, this spray away works pretty good. Um, that's auto body shop secret. Um, I like Worth's Rubber Care. For putting moisture back in rubber seals, rubber gaskets, um, all that, it's silicone free. Um, it's easy to spray like WD-40. And you can buy it by the case if you really want to get silly. Um, but I usually use this after I've put a new piece of windshield glass in um, and or use it to set the glass initially. Um, so this is another good product that silicone free, you throw it around in the booth, let it explode, your paint job's fine. Um, if you need to touch up paint, these little disposable micro applicators, I just bought them on Amazon in the hundreds. Once again, super affordable. They dab better than a toothpick, because I've done that being a pinstriper. And you can control it better and blends in better to your chip. So other things, if you want to get into touching up on the road. Um, I, I, uh, it's not all snake oil, but uh, the snake oil is coming out in that market. Um, so five years ago, seven years ago, when I started my business, um, I got in with a guy in Beverly Hills that was doing the big high-end Beverly Hills cars that were secret, private, all that. And he was kind of the guinea pig for that whole market. And back then, you know, they were baking the ceramic coatings on. They were, you know, all of that nonsense. And he finally found one that, once again, was kind of polymer or plastic-based, I'll say. And um, he kind of revolutionized everybody doing that to the point of if you get a ceramic coat now and you're trying to bake it on, that's the snake oil and you better run away. Um, most of them claim that they'll either last a lifetime, last five years, or last two years. 
tried the five-year ones, I've tried the lifetime ones, and this is with me traveling I-70 between St. Louis and Kansas City every two weeks for four and a half years. I'm here to tell you, even with good detailer maintenance, those coatings on the market, no matter what you do or what they are, probably going to last you about two and a half years if you take good care of it. And if you don't bake it on. <laughs> if you bake it on, you ruin your paint job. The ceramic isn't going to protect anything. And you got taken for a ride on price, probably. So um, the, the companies I do like using right now are Blackfire. Uh, Blackfire is good, good user-friendly products. And then the new one I got into, it's spelled Q-U-E-O-N. So good luck pronouncing that, but, um, and they look all in fancy colored bottles and whatnot, because, you know, half of it's still trying to be marketing, but, um, but they're affordable. You can do a whole huge Rolls-Royce full classic with about, you know, two packages of it, you know, basically under 300 bucks, so your daily driver, you know, is in that range, and, um, yeah, so ceramic coating technology is coming around, and it's a whole lot better. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of snake oil companies still trying to have their last final hurrah with it before it becomes just standardized. I mean, just like wax and everything. So, um, and yeah, from driving on the highway and and really beating up a 2016 Impala. I mean. You got two and a half years on the highway if you're traveling every two weeks as a businessman. Sure. What makes paint that you elevated It gets too dry. It gets too chemically dry. Not just like air dry, but chemically dry. It loses the chemical binders in it. And so what it does is just like your skin, it dries out and it wrinkles and it cracks and it comes off of the substrate. So metal doesn't necessarily function like your skin, it functions like the hard layer. So let's say a piece of glass, let's say you have your skin on a piece of glass, if that skin dries out, well your glass is still there, but you've you know, flaked your skin on the floor, so to speak. Um, that's a really rough <laughs> analogy there, but I mean that's, that's the point of like these lacquers. You can put moisture back into these lacquers all day long. You keep polishing them, seal them over, keep waxing them, keep waxing them, keep waxing them. It sounds like the simplest snake oil thing on earth going. But what it does is it not only seals it off, it's like lotion on your hands, it's putting moisture back into the paint. So that the chemicals that are still thriving are chemically working together so that that doesn't happen. You've had a question. I've missed you. So in your case, um, you, okay, I'll give you the, the hopefully the shortest answer to that. You can put lacquer, let me let's see if I get this right here. You can put enamel on lacquer, paint. Can't go the other way around. Um, tried doing that pinstriping and it has not treated me well. Um, so it depends on what paint you got. My guess is if it's all original and it hasn't been repainted, you probably are in a lacquer style paint bracket. So you could do a modern enamel or single stage over that. I would recommend stripping it and doing such to get the look, but the durability. Um, however, if you got a good body mint and they can do it one over the other, you can do it that way. But you can't go lacquer on top of enamel. Because that enamel is so hard, like I said, like an M&M, &M, it's going to say, nope, that was, a good sh that was a good try. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming to the casino, you know, so. Um, 
I hope that helps. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, just thanks for having me. I know this is information overload. It could turn into a three-day seminar because I've done it. Um, and I know you guys are hobbyists and drivers. So, you know, my biggest thing is these are just some simple ways to help maintain and preserve your car um, to as easy or technical as you want to get. Um, but even on the technical Pebble Beach level, with everything I've done, just work smarter, not harder. So, yeah. Thank you. You're going to spend a lot of money. Um, well, I, no, I'm going to be truthful. You're going to spend a lot of money because right now, well, even before COVID hit, the material costs were through the roof. So a simple, you know, little this era car, Model T, Model A, whatever, uh, you were dropping 30 grand in material before you got into labor. And that's... And that's not a Concord paint job. That's an auto body paint job. Um, so the material cost, the material, yeah. So if you're thinking about repainting your car, I'm not going to, like, keep you from doing it. But know that even before all of this inflation that's going on hit, you're paying for the materials, not the labor. Um, I said thank you to the committee. Absolutely. Thank you to all of you for coming and for for giving us your day, your weekend, your travel time. Um, it, it, it's because of you that this happens. So thank you for that. Um, and we have just a really uh, thank you to the presenters again. Um, Luke Channel, Mariah Bryans, David Liepelt and Ken Kennedy. Uh, we've got a small gift for them. If you would, just one more round of applause for them and thank them.